Oh. oh, that's good to know. Somebody asked me if it was going to be recorded because they couldn't come. Well, hello. Um, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this coffee hour. My name is Don Fixico, and I'm the acting chair of the Anti-Racism Committee and just uh, the acting chair until Julian Lim gets back. So we started this tradition of the coffee hour. And so it's, uh, this is about the fourth or fifth one. And it's really to improve race relations and honor people who've done things for race relations. And so this is an, an endeavor that we hope to continue. And so uh, I want to talk about to be on April 15 from two o'clock to three o'clock and it will be looking at Asian Americans in the United States. So we will be talking to Professor Karen Kuhn and also Professor Angela Yellowhorse and Professor Karen Leon. And so that will be April 15 at two o'clock to three o'clock uh, then. So today we have uh, Stanley James and so she's gonna be talking, but the co-host for this is uh, Professor Andrew Barnes mm -hmm. and also uh, assistant Professor uh, Shamara Al Hassan. So, uh, Shamara, here you go. Well, thank you so much, uh, Don, for that introduction, and thank you, Stanley, for being with us today. Um, so, I'm just going to ask the first question and feel free to answer it in whatever way you choose. Um, so we're all living through an extremely challenging time right now with multiple pandemics of COVID-19, white supremacy, economic depression, the list goes on. Over the course of your career, you have somehow managed to overcome many obstacles and be able to thrive. So can you talk about one major achievement and one major challenge in your career and what strategies you use to achieve your goal or overcome the challenge? There's so many. <laughs> 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 um, I was thinking about that and I thought one thing I'll share that I, I haven't probably talked about much and which may be important, especially for graduate students um, I, when I went to graduate school, um, I was newly divorced and the mother of a three-year-old and um, had moved, you know, kind of across several states to get there. Um, so that was, you know, a challenge to say the least. Um, and I always say that my daughter and I went to grad school together because she was you know, a, a big part of it. But one of the biggest challenges that occurred was when I was about to take my comps. Um, prior to that, by about mm, maybe two months, my father died um, unexpectedly. And it, it was bizarre because it happened that he was in Denver attending a meeting and that's where I went to school was at the University of Denver. And so we had spent time and then I got a call that he was staying in the hotel where the meeting was. And I got a call that he had been hospitalized and they didn't know what it was. And, you know, so that was just, it was really quite something. And I had to call my mother and get her to come out and, you know, and then he ultimately died. And, you know, then I had to go home for the funeral and all of these kinds of things. And, you know, I'm, I'm preparing to take comps. So I came back because I had a date for when the comps were supposed to be. And um, I decided that I just had to go on. Meanwhile, my daughter gets chicken pox <laughs> like two days before I'm gonna take comps. And uh, she's about maybe five, six by this time, five o'clock. And she's just miserable. And she's walking around and saying stuff like, this is the worst thing that ever happened to me in my entire life. You know, she was quite dramatic to say the least. And I lived in student housing and the cold, the hot water went out. Okay. The only thing that she liked or that gave her any relief was warm baths. 
So I'm trying to take comps. I'm in motion. I have a sick child. I'm heating up water to give her warm bath <laughs> every two or three hours to kind of keep her settled down. And it was just the most horrible experience that I can think about at that particular time. And I did not pass my comps. Mm -hmm. So that was a setback, a really difficult setback. And I had very good friends in grad school who were saying to me, we don't know why you took those exams anyway you shouldn't have been taking them just because that was the date that you had agreed to. It was a week long. The comps were for us a week long. Um, you're not, you weren't ready. Not in terms of academically, but emotionally and psychologically, I just was not, my head was not in it. So, you know, this was major, you know, absolutely major. So I had to just sort of back up, uh, swallow my, embarrass my embarrassment. It was not only a blow to my, it was a blow to my pride. My, I was embarrassed. I was just, I was just a mess. And um, I just had to take the time First of all, to grieve the loss of my father, which was the most important thing. Figure out, you know, what we were doing as a family, you know, with my, my brother and sister and my mother and all of those things that one has to do. Um, think about what we had to do, you know, the, the stuff that you need to do about when someone dies, uh, all of those kinds of things. And then I had to figure out, you know, get my, my daughter, find, she of course recovered from chicken pox, but you know, that was just intense, you know, and get her up and back and into, into things. So I did take the comps again, but several, several months later, because I needed that time to really get myself together. And when I took them the second time, you know, I was in a better place and I did pass. Uh, so I, I think that uh, this is a nice segue to my question, which is that when you reflect back to the message that you were trying to convey in your teaching and mentoring when you started your career, how is that different now? Or what do you, what's the message you're trying to convey now? Uh, and I, I, that story thought I thought was a really good example of, of, of what you what you think about and try to emphasize at the end. But what was there in the beginning? Well, one of the good things about going to grad school when I did was that I had been out and worked for a while, had a bit of a career. Um, I didn't, you know, go to grad. I didn't go pursue the Ph.D. immediately. Um, after I finished, let me back up. I got, I have two master's degrees. So the first one I got immediately after I um, graduated uh, from undergraduate school. Then I, you know, got out, uh, pursued a career, got married, had a child, got divorced. And so when I came back to work, I was quite I was a bit older than uh, some of the other graduate students who just came in right away. And so I had a different um, perspective in the sense that I recognized that I had to be able to uh, be able to multitask. It was clear to me that I had to be a good mother to my child. That was, you know, like at the top of the list, you know, was that I had to take care of her. Secondly, it was clear that I had to be very good at pursuing my career. Because thirdly, under no circumstances was I ever going to be unemployed. Because I had to take care of my child. 
So many of the decisions that I made um, revolved around that, you know, being pragmatic and practical, but also pursuing an academic career. Um, and because I had been through some of these things, I felt like I was in a position to be um, understanding of the kinds of things that students experience. Because um, I feel like at times faculty don't recognize that students have lives and that they have things happen to them that um, you know, we're not aware of as we stand up in front of the class. Um, so I wanted to be sure that I uh, provided my students with what I thought was really important in terms of what I wanted them to learn. Um, and I'm not talking about they needed to know that in 1847 such and such happened or, you know, I am very historical, but I'm not good with dates. How's that? <laughs> but um, I wanted them to be sure to learn how to think, um, to be engaged not only in the scholarship, but also engaged in what was going on around them in the world and to figure out how those two were interrelated or how they could be interrelated. So I've always been, you know, a feminist. Um, I've always been anti-racist. Um, those kinds of things evolved over the years as things changed. So for example, when I started and talked about anti-racism, I was almost wholly fo focused on African-Americans and Africans. Um, but nowadays, you know, like I am, I am just enraged and, um, sorrowful about what we've had happen here with the, uh, eight Asians that were massacred in Atlanta this week. So my understanding of the world, my understanding of human rights um, expands so that in such a way that I'm, I'm clear about being supportive of or being in, um, in alliance with um, American Indians, with uh, Asian Americans, with uh, LGBTQ, with Syrians, with the Rohingya in Myanmar, you know, um, I'm, I'm very clear that um, my vision has expanded um, over this time. I'm not sure if that gets to what you're... No, no, no. So, so... Mm -hmm. You teach a broader field, mm -hmm. a broader scope now versus when you started? Y yes and yes and no. Um, I've always done human rights, you know, because that was one of my areas of concentration um, when I was in graduate school. Um, international human rights. Um, and then I was, um, you know, <laughs> both into African-American studies and to in African studies. But part of what has happened, I think, is that um, those have expanded in such a way that, you know, you could call it sort of Africana studies because it means that you need to be aware of, you know, Blacks in Europe or the Caribbean or in Brazil or in Mexico, you know, um, so, uh, the, the world, it is a world, um, world perspective, but the, the basis of it is my, my concern and my support of international human rights. Okay. 
Shamar, what happened? Oh, did she go away? Shamar is having a little technical difficulty, so she'll be right back. Okay. All right, well, I'll just ask the third question and she can uh, flip it. All right, uh, after the racial uprising during the summer of 2020, President Michael Crow made black faculty, staff, and students a priority of his administration. Mm -hmm. What gives you hope about the future of racial justice at ASU and the state of Arizona more broadly? <laughs> well, not to put too fine a point on it, uh, I'm more hopeful about ASU than I am about the state of Arizona. <laughs> um, lots of stuff goes on in Arizona that just, you know, boggles the mind uh, politically. Um, well, let me just say this. Uh, I'm very appreciative of uh, uh, Michael Crow's um, uh, response to the Floyd situation and um, in uh, sort of centralizing um, the issues and concerns of African-American studies. I know that this causes concern among other groups who are wondering why should we, you know, be focused on them. Um, it's not just as we have heard, Black Lives Matter, but all lives matter. Um, In the time that I was vice provost um, for um, ASU, for inclusion and community engagement, um, I made it a point to try to address uh, issues across groups. So for example, one of the things I'm really proud of is you know, leading the team that um, went off and um, worked with Excellency in Education, which is a, a national group that works to um, improve Lat Latino and Latina education. And um, we uh, applied for um, and had to you know, prove that we were worthy of something that was called the Seal of Excellencia which was uh, granted to us by uh, Excellencia. We got one of the inaugural seals saying that ASU had been engaged in doing um, important work in uh, promoting the, the, the education of Latinos and, um, and making sure that they graduated. So when people say to me, well, I don't know why you know, you're concerned about, you know, uh, black lives or African Americans, I'm proud to be able to say, but I'm concerned about all. And I think my record, you know, speaks to that. This is another, yet another historic moment in which African Americans have had to bear the brunt of the, the, the systemic and structural racism of this country. And what I know from studying history is that as we have engaged in trying to address those important issues, we have been in the front line, we have been the vanguard that other groups have followed. Um, if you go back and look at the 60s and 70s, it, it was us that was doing this, but the Hispanics uh, came on board and address the issues that they had, as did the American Indians, you know, as did women. Um, so I think that it's important that, and sad that here in the 21st century, we are having to fight these fights again, although differently. And I expect that like we have done historically, African Americans will be engaged in leading that, that struggle, but also engaged in being building alliances with all the other groups. Right. Uh, Shamari, you can ask question number four. 
<laughs> okay, thank you so much. Sorry, I had a, a technical uh, glitch. Um, and just to uh, clarify your comment earlier, um, some people have used All Lives Matter to erase the call yes. for Black Lives Matter. So I just wanted to make sure people didn't under misunderstand when you were saying if you wanted to clarify. Thank you very much, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the uh, next question that we have is um, sort of what message uh, would you uh, give to young women of color in the academy um, that are here maybe listening to you? What sort of advice might you give in terms of navigating a career in the academy? Well, first of all, I do think that um, you have to determine um, um, what is important. And that may vary, you know, from person to person. I have told you what was important to me. Um, and I, and I don't make the assumption that that would be what is important to you. But you have to determine that. Um, I would also say that you have to be passionate about this work. This work is very difficult and you will uh, receive setbacks. You will be disappointed along the way. Uh, so if you are not passionately committed to this work, it's too hard to do. It will be difficult to do anyway, but you, you, the, the passion and the commitment is what helps you to get yourself back up and continue in the struggle. That's about as simple as I can put it, I think. Okay. I, uh, so let me uh, move on to the next question we have for you. Uh, for young people looking at the chaos happening in the world right now and considering whether it is worth it to financially invest in their education, particularly with rising student debt and decreasing jobs that offer a livable wage, what do you think the future of tertiary education is and what advice would you give those students in, these, in this predicament? Um. One of the things that's helpful, and I go back to it all the time, uh, that's very helpful to me at ASU, and I hope is helpful to others, um, is our charter. You know, the charter says in what, 40 words, um, what it is that is important to us. And part of what is important to us is to prepare ourselves to go back and make a change or make a difference in our communities. Um, I am so hopeful that this country does not return to the way it used to be. You know, after the after we managed to get through the pandemic, I'm pretty sure we can't. But what I'm hopeful for is that as we return to uh, what may pass for normal or what, what people think is more normal, um, that when we do that, we will come back with more compassion, with a realization that we can't keep doing things the way that we have been doing them. Um, if we are concerned about, you know, uh, people, you know, if we really are concerned about people and how they are living. Um, and I, I feel that students who, um, I hope that students are committed to wanting to be engaged in the processes of transformational change, which means they can come and do it in all different kinds of ways. You know, um, you know, it can be scientific, um, it can be in literature. Um, I think about, for example, one of the people that I, I'm really excited to watch how she does 
is um, here on this campus is Natalie Diaz, you know. Um, she is doing fantastic work. And I am excited to hear about the work that she is doing to, to um, save her language. You know, that's very important, very important. Um, I remember that uh, 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 SST, my school um, has been engaged over the years with working um, with um, American Indians in, in um, New Mexico. With, uh, it, they have a program that uh, is engaged with helping people to achieve a PhD. Um, and they go to New Mexico to work with them faculty from here, you know, get on a plane and go to Mexico and work with them there. And then they come here, you know, several times within the program. But the point of the program is to help them achieve the education that they, they are seeking with the absolute conviction that that education that they have achieved will be used for the betterment of their community. They're, they're, they, they work from home to, to achieve the degree and they will use that degree to make a difference in their community. That's a new way of looking at education. You know, uh, it's a way of saying, well, maybe we have to go to you and then you can come to us as well. You know, so these are things that I hope is happening in terms of how we think about education, how we develop education in such a way that it could meet a much broader um, uh, array of needs than what we may have done prior to this. Thank you. Uh... Uh, Shamar, you can ask the last question if you like. Yeah, and I just wanted to mention that if uh, the audience, if you have questions, please feel free to write them in the chat and we'll be moving to Q&A uh, fairly soon. I actually wanted to ask just a follow-up question to what you just said uh, before I asked the last question. Um, and the follow-up question is really, so before the pandemic, there were already concerns around brick and mortar education versus online education. And I think uh, the transition to online has opened up, as you have mentioned, certain opportunities to meet uh, students where they are at at home. Um, mm -hmm. But it also has revealed uh, stark differences in terms of uh, mm -hmm. people's access to technology. And so I just wanted to ask sort of what do you, you see the future of online ed education is uh, versus sort of the brick and mortar? And, you know, how do you see uh, things going in terms of accessibility in the future to make sure everyone has access uh, to technology as a human right fundamentally, right? It's funny you should say this, just as an aside. Many, you know, I, I tell you that um, human rights is my, one of my areas of concentration. Many years ago, um, one of the Nordic countries, I can't remember which one, actually made it a human right for everybody to own a TV. <laughs> At that time, this would be, you know, back in the, in the 20th century. <laughs> and they said that, you know, you can't live without having access to a TV. And so they literally made it a human right that everybody has to own one. So I'm thinking like, okay, so now here we are in the 21st century and um, we need to recognize, I think one of the things that I hope would happen is that we recognize that this is a human right that you not only need to have access to, um, you know, computers and hotspots or whatever it is that you need um, to be able to be connected to the world, but that you have to have access to how to use it. It's one thing to be able to have it. It's another thing for you to be able to use it. Now I'm saying all this to, tell, to say, but I want you to understand that. I'm kind of glad that I'm getting out of the academy about now because <laughs> I am not excited about using technology. I mean, I use it, but 
oh my God, you know, I'm a 20th century woman trying to operate in the 21st century and it's, it's tough, you know? <laughs> but it is, it is important. And I think that um, people, young people coming along are in a much better position in terms of, because it's their, this is their lifetime. This is their lifetime. So they're used to it. They will become even more used to it. Where the problem is, is whether or not we'll have a digital divide in the same way that we have class divides. We have it, but can we address it? And can we address it in a way that makes it, makes it so that people are on, uh, on equal footing. So, so can I just ask, so mm -hmm. has the situation progressed? I mean, that, yes, we've gone from everybody has a right to, t to a TV to everyone has a right to have access to the internet. Uh, and I'm asking, do we look at that as progress? Um, one of the things that I think about progress is that um, we tend to try to think of progress as being always positive, and that's not the case. There are times when progress is not positive, and what has to happen, and that, and that we're not all moving in one straight direction towards progress, you know. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of little side trips all along the way, and one of the things that I hope happens um, in this new era is not only that we have people who are having, you know, better access to these kinds of things that they need to have access to, but that as we're educating people, people who are uh, being educated will begin to think of how to do things differently than they might have done it before. Um, so that people who don't have access to things can have better access. Um, years ago, when I was, you know, um, back and forth to um, Africa, uh, one of the things that happened, like on the course, the coast of West Africa, is that there's a lot of fishing. Now, sometimes the men do the fishing. Mostly, the men do the fishing, but then the women were smoking the fish so that they could, you know, sell it in the marketplace and, you know, obviously make a living. But there was somebody who um, looked at this, noticed that it was, um, it was um, difficult to do in the sense of being able to do a lot of it um, and being able to do it fairly easily. And uh, somebody thought about it, um, I don't know who it was, um, but someone who had been educated in, in, in some of the sciences. And they came up with something that they called a chorker smoker. Shamir, do you, do you remember hearing about that or ever hearing about it? I actually but, don't remember hearing about it, but. Yeah, yeah, and at that time it was amazing because it provided women with a way to be able to smoke lots more fish you know, and, uh, and this was useful um, in helping them to, you know, um, be, be better able to support their families. And it was cleaner, it was um, efficient, and it was effective. So whoever did it, and I don't know who, who did it, obviously had a technological or an engineering mind that could be used to uh, address a problem in a way that made sense for the community where it was needed. This is the kind of thing that we have to um, continue to do in the 21st century with the things that we have available now. And that's actually a perfect segue to our last question, which with the amazing career that you have had, what is the second act that you hope to continue uh, to do? What are you excited about? What are you looking forward to? You know, we want to be a little nosy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I was trying to th think about what is it that I want to do because um, mo mostly I've been, you know, kind of overwhelmed. Um, you know, we moved all this, they moved all this stuff to my house, you know, all these books and papers and stuff. And my study was just like <laughs> books all over the, it was just, you know, so I have spent the last, like, I decided it was a Lipton project. It would give me six weeks to work on, you know, getting rid of stuff and, you know, whatever. So that's what I've been doing. And, um, it's been actually wonderful because um, among the things that I have, I, you know, I'm quite the pack rat apparently. I found, you know, letters from and commentary from students, you know, from way back in the Madison days um, that were just, you know, they almost made me cry, you know, that uh, I didn't know I still had. And it, it was just quite affirming. But um, one of the things that I'm looking forward to uh, well, let me back up and say this. I think that all of us who are scholars started out by being bookworms. We all love to read whatever it was that, you know, we're into. And then we got into this business and I don't know about you, but the love to read kind of disappeared because you have to do so much reading to make sure that you can do your work, you know, or to prepare your lectures or to do whatever it is that, write your papers and that kind, or your books and that kind of thing. So what I am looking forward to, and I have, I found all these books that I hadn't read yet, is um, relearning the love of reading in terms of what I want to read when I want to read it. And I think that's quite a luxury. And I'm, I'm looking forward to working on that. Um, the second thing is that um, uh, I'm thinking that there are some things I would like to consult about. Um, the funny thing that's going on right now is that I'm getting all kinds of um, um, letters from universities asking me, would I be interested in coming to be their um, inaugural, you know, vice provost of, of diversity, equity, and inclusion, you know, and it's surprising because, uh, you know, I'm not soliciting this at all, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I, it's kind of surprising and it's gratifying at the same time. And I thought about it, I thought, you know, in fact, I've just, as a matter of fact, today wrote two, two notes to people saying, thank you so much, but I don't really want to do this right now. What I would be interested in doing is specific projects on a consultancy basis. Um, so there's a finite time, there's a specific, you know, you know goal, and then I can say, okay, I'm tired of this and go home. That sounds like an amazing second act. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see if anybody wants anything from me, you know, <laughs> or is interested in me wanting to do something. <laughs> yes. So we want to open the floor to uh, questions uh, from the audience or comments. Yeah. If I may, um, I wanted to first say, Stanley, uh, your class on human rights was one of the most challenging classes that uh, as a librarian we ever dealt with. And I wanted to ask you um, both the students um, um, reactions to the evidentiary um, investigation of UN uh, documents dealing with uh, human rights. And, and secondly, does the Academy pay enough attention to the United Nations? Yeah. Um, and and it's in, particularly its impact in terms of human rights and, and uh, global reach. I, I think that um, 
the very it's very challenging to use UN documents, and I was really um, gratified that you you um, you made them do that. I I just wanted to see if you had any thoughts on uh, on that and those those exercises. Yeah, you know um, that putting that class together, um, I I taught it in Madison. Um, before I came here. And that was, that was one of the, I love doing it. Um, but it was a little different in Madison because um, Madison was um, uh, a UN repository and not every um, university is a UN repository. And they literally had all the documents. This is, be you know, before people got involved with, you know, putting everything online. And the UN has gone about putting stuff online now so you can get a lot of it that way but then they just had these old dusty um you know uh papers you know that uh were in a section that students uh, students don't go to the library anyway but they especially don't go to the UN, UN part of the library they had no idea where it was and um so I made them I made up some assignments where they had to go and they had to learn, you know, pick a pick a UN convention of some sort and learn about it. You know, where did it come from? Why did it happen? Who signed on to it? What does it mean if you if you're a signatory to it? What does it mean if if you're not? You know, how does it how does it affect the laws that um, happen in your in your country and how is it implemented and all of those kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. and so, my, I. There was before I got here, you know, I had there was a person in um, Madison who was a librarian that did, um, um, you know, these kinds of docs. You know, she was she became and she was an expert in these kinds of docs. And so we went to see her. You know, I took the class to see her and she explained all of this. And then they had an assignment they had to do like within the first three or four weeks. And, you know, they're looking at this and they're not knowing what the heck is going on. And so then they get started on doing it and they're like, you know, panicking, they're going crazy. And she made herself available to them, you know, and they went to see her and she helped them through all of this and helped them to find whatever it was that they need. And, and so when they got through with all of that, at the end of the class, they told me that they loved it because they learned how to do something that nobody else knew how to do, you know, was how to use UN docs. And they loved her because they couldn't have done it without her. So they wanted to get her a present, you know. So we had conversations about what to get. And then um, I think we got her, an, or they got her an orchid. They gave me money and I went out and we got her an orchid. And then they wrote a letter from the whole class and they sent it and they took it to her. She just was practically in tears because nobody had ever, you know, thought that much about what the work was that she was doing, that they would respond in such a way. But I've, I had people since then from that particular class or from this class who occasionally write and tell me that they're engaged in doing human rights work. And this was the foundation for it. So that's one of my favorite memories about, you know, doing this work because it is very different and it requires a whole different way of, of trying to deal with things. And you're right, they were challenged and they continue to be challenged. And, you know, I couldn't do it without the librarians. Uh, 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 Shamara has have, is having technical difficulties. And so I'm going to uh, just offer a follow-up to that. Oh, she's back, hello? She needs to un. She's. You you muted, muted still. Jamar. Oh, sorry. Yes. Hey. Um, my, I had another technical issue. Sorry about that. Um. So so my my follow up to what you just said to uh, Mr. Edding there was, uh, you identified one legacy. Are there other legacies you'd like to identify? 
Oh, you mean uh, other than the human right? Oh, yeah. Um, there's several things. Um, one is that, you know, uh, many, many years ago, we did theorizing Black feminisms. Um, and that was like, that, you know, that's an interesting thing because um, what happened was that I was, uh, you know, trying to be Black feminist. <laughs> and I was reading all these different things. And I was kind of frustrated because I couldn't figure out what con conference to go to, to get, <laughs> to, to meet up these, with these people who were doing this work. I mean, they were in literature, they were in history, they were in sociology, they were in this, that, and other. And so I told this to the Black women in Afro-American studies, where I was in the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Nellie McKay and Frida High Testified Georgis and, and, uh, and they said, well, you need to have your own conference and then you can invite who you want to come. And they went and sort of browbeat the men in the department and got the money. And so I got to sit down and say, I want to talk to this one. I want to talk to that one. I want to talk to the other one. And uh, so we had our first Black feminist seminar. And not everybody came, but you know we had a good you know a good group. And um, that was funny because we made it closed and we met for about three days. And um, part of what had we had to do was to have an open session so that people could come at some point during this. But before that, we had these two days of just sitting down and talking to each other. And these people were from, you know, these women were from different universities. They were experiencing different issues around racism and sexism. And this is back in the early days. And um, I mean, people were talking about all kinds of things. One person, one, one very well-known person talked about being um, having had a boyfriend who, when she broke up with him, began to um, uh, try to assault her in different kinds of ways, you know. Um, he, he did things like go around and put in men's bathrooms, things that said, for a good time, call this number, you know, yes. her number. And uh, one of the things that was clear it was horrible he 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 actually burned her car up you know i mean this was just an awful thing yes. and um she talked about how that bell hooks who was a very good friend of hers went with her to to you know try to erase her number from these places you know um that had been where it had been posted and uh, you know, those kinds of stories came out in this, this session that we were having and we had to deal with it. You know, we had to talk about what does it mean that black women are experiencing violence and how do we, how do we address this? And what does it mean about if we address this about black men, if, if a black man is abusing us, can we, can we actually uh, object to that? Can we, or do we have to worry about whether or not he's gonna be put in the system and you know, all kinds of things like that came out in that thing. And that session and the women, I mean, they were like, they became joined at the hip. You know, they just, they didn't wanna to go to dinner together. I, I mean, without each other or to lunch or to whatever, it was just an amazing time. So finally we had to open up you know, and because people were like watching us at the University of Wisconsin, they were trying to figure out what the hell are all them black women doing? <laughs> you know, why are they there? Why are they closing? How come we can't go in? And so we had to have this session, which we had on a Saturday afternoon late, around four o'clock in the afternoon, in the midst of, it was the end of the semester, so it was in the midst of the time when people were supposed to be studying for exams. And the place was packed. It was like, oh, we finally get to find out what these women are doing in this place. Yeah. 
Uh, so, and then, you know, th that was just another story. But anyway, we, we had that meeting and we decided we had to meet again. And so we met at Spelman the second time for the second Black Feminist Seminar. And then from that, um, we, that's where we put together Theorizing Black Feminisms, which became really a foundational text in, uh, in, the, uh, in the Black Women's Studies movement. So that was, that was really one. Going to um, the Black Feminist uh, movement at MIT, um, in, in 94 was another one. That was funny um, because MIT was mostly white males and there were 2000 black women wandering around their comp <laughs> the, the, the campus. And you know, they see us coming, some of them like would come outside and stand and look at us as we were walking around campus. Others would see us coming and literally scurry back in their office and close and lam the, lock the doors to keep us out. So that was quite something. Um, uh, going with Aswa to Ghana was at, that was the best conference I've ever been to in my life. You know, so I mean, there's so many many highlights. Um, we did the president's um, Madam President here at ASU. I don't know if any of you remember that. Where we, I, I realized at one point that we had all of these black women or women of color who had been suddenly um, elected to um, the, uh, the societies, you know, that had never, this had never happened before. So we had somebody from um, American Political Science Association, um, the American Studies, the National Women's Studies Association, African Studies Association, the American Sociological Association, the American Library Association. I mean, it was like, and I, I looked at this and I thought, is anybody looking at this besides me? Does anybody notice what's happening here? We have um, American Indian, we have Asian, we have African American, all of these women in this one period are now presidents of all of these learned societies. Somebody has to, to acknowledge that. We have to look at that because that is a critical step that we have made in the academy that nobody's talking about. So I went and um, had a meeting with Michael Crow and I told him this and he gave me, he said, well, how much money do you need? And he gave it to me. And we had this, you know, and it was amazing. And, you know, they were coming from uh, the American Historical, uh, the um, OAS, Organization of uh, American Historians. Yeah. What, yeah. I'm saying it wrong. What is it? Or, or, organization of American Historians, OAS. Yeah, okay. Or, organization of American Historians. You know, we had, and then we had them come and they talked about their experiences, um, how they became president, why they wanted to do that, what did they accomplish in their years as their year as a president, which was just fascinating. And then they went to their respective disciplines. They met with the, the faculty and the graduate students. Um, in history and literature and African American stuff, African and African American stuff, you know, we sent them out. And it was like, you know, I think it was an amazing, they had lunch with, you know, people, we had them, we had a big luncheon. We put one at each table and we invited people to come and sit with them and talk to them over. I, I, I remember that conference very well. Because mm -hmm. uh, uh, that, was that was a nice lunch. I appreciated it. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Oh, we've got one last question I was hoping you, uh, and it's uh, uh, now that it's more common to have leadership roles in diversity and inclusion, uh, now it's, com it's, it's more common, but I'm curious when you first took the post, was this position difficult? When I first, the took one the that I'm in that, I was in, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not to put too fine a point on it. Um, part of it is because 
I didn't really actually have a portfolio. Um, they pretty much said, you know, you can do what you want with it. So that kind of, I had to stop a minute and think about, well, what do I want to do? And how am I going to do this? And of course I knew that. And, and then the other thing that was happening is because this is the biggest university in the country, as soon as that word went out that I would, took this position, I just was like inundated with, work, with um, requests from all over the country about what did I think about this? And, you know, I didn't know what I thought. I was still trying to unpack books in my office, you know, little. <laughs> but um, so I had to think about, you know, and acknowledge that, uh, first of all, this is not my job and it's not my responsibility. This is ASU's job and responsibility. So what I needed to do was to figure out how to um, engage this strategically um, and appropriately. So the first thing, one of the first things that I did, and in fact, I said before I would take the job, I would have to, this had to happen, um, was to uh, send the white male deans, as many as I could get together, to something called the White Men's Caucus. Um, and they went for a week, you know, five days. I sent, and it was a special, this organization is a national organization that had been working mainly with Fortune 500 country, companies, but they were now working with um, the upper echelon of administration in universities. So I sent four the first time, uh, four uh, and four the next time. I sent them to, and they, they spent a week learning why it was absolutely critical for them to um, understand what the problems were about uh, and how they had to be a leader in promoting diversity and inclusion, why it was so critical. And I'm telling you, I sent those guys off and they came back, you know, like, changed. I used to say, it, you know, they used to say in the Black community, I've been to the mountain pot top, you know. <laughs> and uh, they had, they came back, they knew, I, so I didn't have to have an argument or a discussion with them about why it was important for them to do X, Y, or Z. You know, and, and if I heard something, I could call them up and say, hey, look, I just heard this. What's going on? How are you doing? And they were on it and ready to deal with it. And that was so important because it was a critical mass of eight male deans at Arizona State University who had an understanding of why they needed to be allies uh, in the struggle for diversity and inclusion. Thank you. Uh, uh, Shamar, do you have any uh, last comment? Hmm? Well, I just want to uh, say thank you uh, for sharing your experiences from being a graduate student, a single mother going to graduate school, trying to take your comps with all of the challenges to your continued efforts around human rights and raising the consciousness around the discrimination and oppression of all people um, and to your efforts to educate the upper echelons of the administration. I think your legacy is definitely secured and lives on in all of the amazing work that you've done. And so we just are so grateful um, from the anti-racism uh, committee and shippers for you spending this time with us today. Well, thank you for asking me. I really appreciated it. It made me stop and think, because you know, these are things that you don't really, you don't sit around thinking about them. <laughs> You're just trying to do the work. <laughs> okay. uh, yes. uh, so, so thank you, uh, Stanley. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, I'm certain that Rachel will sort of create a, a video of this for your uh, for you to enjoy. Okay, thank you so much. I was trying. I was just going to look at the uh, the the. Uh, okay. Yeah, I was looking at the chat. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All See right. you guys, uh, Adon. Sorry. Do you, oh. you want to say something? Oh, only that, uh, Stanley. Thank you very much. 
And we also want to appreciate and thank the efforts of Rachel Bunning, who uh, handled the technical side of this, and also to uh, Becky Singh, who's the kind of overall manager of the coffee hours, and also Erica May for being the, uh, the public relations person on all of this. So it, it's a full team effort and uh, it went well. Thank you. Great. Okay. okay.